It's my pleasure, everyone, to introduce Felix Kwok today. He will be our last speaker of the semester in the CRM Applied Math Seminar. Um, Felix has been actually at McGill when he did his undergrad. So he just told me that he left uh, McGill in 2002 uh, to do his, uh, his PhD in Stanford. And then he moved around a lot. He was actually in, um, in Geneva for some years. And then after, after that, he was in Hong Kong for six years. He was teaching there, he was a professor there. And uh, he just recently moved in these crazy times. He just moved as a professor at the Université Laval in Quebec City, uh, where he is uh, now an assistant professor, I believe. Is that correct, Felix? Yeah. yeah. And today he's our last speaker of the semester, as I was saying before, and he'll be speaking about parallel in time numerical solution of time dependent PDs. Please, Felix, the floor is all yours. Oh, thank you very much, Jean-Philippe, for the very nice introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me uh, to you know, give a talk at the Applied Mathematics Seminar at the CRM. It's really my pleasure and honor to see all of you and uh, to, you know, to be able to show you a little bit about you know, what I have been working on recently. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, parallel in time numerical solution of time dependent PDEs. So par uh, parallel numerical methods are things that I have started working on, uh, looking at, you know, when I started my postdoc in Geneva uh, with uh, Martin Gander, whom some of you may know. Um, this was a few years ago already. Uh, so uh, th th that is, of course, one of the you know, people that I work a lot with, and you're going to see that, uh, the work that I did with him um, you know, in, as part of this talk. I've also worked with other people such as Ben Ong at uh, Michigan Technological University, Julia, Julian Salomon in INRIA, Hui Zhang in uh, Xi'an Jiao Tong Liverpool University. And there are also related work by um, other co-authors um, from you know, uh, the play people that I've met you know, but during my uh, PhD and postdoc and you know, more recently. So let me give you some, uh, you know, in well, a, a brief introduction to uh, parallel and time methods. So basically, we're talking about time-dependent PDEs here. Okay, so for example, we could be looking at the wave equation and the Navier-Stokes equation. So things that evolve in time. Okay, and so of course, uh, so one of the examples that you know uh, I looked at was something that you know tracks contaminants in water that is flowing. So for example, the geometry here is, you know, you have a, a kind of a bay where your water flows into the bay and then out of the bay, the coast is this curved piece of the boundary. Okay. And then, you know, the, uh, and then, you know, we have, let's say, you know, there's some sort of contaminant that's leaking, you know, from, uh, you know, some region inside the bay. Okay. Uh, and then basically we want to know, you know, how the, contaminant the concentration is, is evolving okay so let's so let's say that the uh, contaminant you know follow some sort of advection diffusion equation just as a simple model okay so you have um, the v that is you know the flow of the water in, inside and outside the bay that's carrying um, the ca contaminants around and the contaminant also diffuses as well based on the gradients so the negative gradients okay and then that's how the evolution of the concentration in time, you know, evolves. Okay, and of course, you know, there will be initial and boundary conditions that I'm not going to mention here. All right. Uh, so because of the you know geometry that is non-trivial, you can't do analytical solutions. So we use numerical approximations. Okay. So that will be the forward problem. Let's say you, if you know how much of the contaminants getting released in the water at all times, then you can sort of simulate um, this flow using the uh, advection diffusion equation. And then you can you know, have a simulation of you know, what the concentration is at all times. But sometimes you also want to solve an inverse problem, which is basically you have some sort of sensor, let's say you know, near the shore. At some point you detect that there is you know, some concentration of contaminant that's coming in and you want to know uh, where it's coming from. So you, you want to find a source term that matches some sort of noisy observation um, what, you know, uh, that is you know, the YD here. Okay, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to have some sort of state equation that models the flow. 
with some unknown source u, and then you're trying to choose the u so that it matches your observations as best as possible. So you're trying to minimize a functional from you know, the integral from zero to t of the difference between your simulated uh, uh, concentration and the one that's actually observed. Okay. And then, of course, you know, that's an ill pose problem. So, what you want to do is you want to do some sort of regularization. You want to say, you know, you did, you, you, the, 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 the amount of contaminant is also penalized so that, you know, you, there, there is, you know, you're trying to have a source that is as small as possible while making the, you know, observations close to the simulated value. Okay. So, this gives a minimization problem that can actually be solved, you know, numerically on a computer. So I've actually done that, and so I made a little movie about this. Um, so basically, what you're seeing here is that um, you have some observation. Let's say, you know, at some point, you know, there's some contaminant that appears. Okay, so this is looking a little bit suspicious. Originally, there is none, and then you see some bump here. So there's contaminant that's coming out so maybe someone's releasing it into the water okay and then what you're trying to do is you're trying to calculate the source that matches this observation okay and and also you know with that source you want to look at what the uh, con contaminant concentration is you know the, uh, you know as a function of time so what you play this okay so initially there's no contaminants and then you know just before you know, you see the con the concentration one you're going to see the source lighting up because there's a delay between the source being released and the water bringing it to the sensor so the light up is going to happen before this uh, this jump here if you pay close attention you see it lights up while it's still zero and this is all calculated on the computer okay so what is it that is needed in order to have some you know to make this calculation. So, oh, okay, uh, no, let me just go back. Just go back. Okay. So what, so what sort of, uh, so how much work is needed to, you know, do a sort of, uh, you know, th this kind of uh, computation? Well, so first of all, um, you need to discretize your PDU. You need to, you know, you can't solve, you know, for the continuous solution. So, what you do is you take, you put a grid onto your domain, and then you're going to need many points because you want a certain number of resolution. And also, it's the geometry is complex, so you know you 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 need to fit to the geometry, and you, yeah, so so you have many degrees of freedoms coming out of there. You have a large number of unknowns. It could be you know up to a million or even more unknowns, you know, for a very fine resolution. You need to integrate the problem over many time steps, and then you know all of these uh, linear systems or nonlinear systems are ill-conditioned. So you need to solve these systems, and if you use an iterative method, that's going to take many iterations. And that's only the forward problem. If you want to solve the uh, the inverse problem, uh, then you need uh, many realizations. You need to have have an optimization loop, so you need to solve the forward problem many times okay and then you know if you if you're trying to simulate this for a long time then you know that's many many time steps so it's very all very time consuming uh and also you know because of these large systems it may not even fit in one uh, computer okay so the solution nowadays is to go use parallel computing so you take one of these very large computers um the, so there's a website called top500.org that you know, periodically updates, you know, what the largest supercomputers are in the world and how many uh, floating point operations it can do per second. So the largest supercomputer in the world, I just checked, this is in November 2020, that's the newest list, is a supercomputer called Fugaku in Japan, and it has 7 million, 7.6 million cores, okay, so think, think of each of them as being separate computers that can run a calculation in parallel and then combined they can do 500 petaflops uh, pet, you know, uh, flowing point operations per second so this is five to 500 times 10 to the 15 operations per second okay so that's really a lot of calculations you can do
do. But it doesn't mean that you can do all of them in sequence. It means that you know you basically take this uh, this number of flops and you divide by seven million. So somehow you need to prepare your problem in such a way that there are seven million independent pieces that can be fed into different computers. So um, it's tricky to be able to use all of this, and then they also need to talk to each other, and the communication takes time as well. So so it's it's a non-trivial problem to be able to exploit this sort of computing power. So this is the fastest one in the world. Uh, the supercomputer in Canada with the most cores is actually the Beluga uh, cluster, which is in Quebec. Uh, I think it's actually in Montreal. It's sitting in ETS, if I remember correctly. So you're not too far down the street from McGill. And uh, that one has 72,000 cores. Okay, and you can do 7.4 terif, uh, no, 7,400 teraflops, or about, so seven petaflops, okay, per second. So it's not as big as the fastest one, but it's still pretty big, okay? So you have to figure out how to cut up your uh, problem into 72,000 pieces in order to use the Luga effectively, okay? So that's the problem that we're facing, okay? We, we have a huge problem. We need to somehow reformulate our algorithms um, so that it can, it has this many pieces and it can occupy all the computers that we have. Okay. So that's the problem, you know, that's facing us, you know, in parallel computing, um, especially in terms of numerical solution of problems that arise from PDEs. So when I talk about cutting up your problem, a very natural method is called domain decomposition methods. So actually it's not one method, it's a family of methods and they all differ in, in flavors and conditions and all that. But it's a very rich field. I'm gonna give you a brief bibliography in a minute. But the basic idea is very simple. Take your domain. So this, this is a, you know, so basically your, domain in space. It could also be in space-time. We can also talk about a space-time domain. And then you just basically cut it up, you know, either, you know, based on the geometry, like the four by four decomposition here, or you can use some sort of automatic partitioner to make subdomains that are, you know, they're not regularly shaped. You know, it's just sort of done algebraically. Okay. So once you cut up the domain, you have smaller versions of your problem. So for example, in one of the smallest squares, you're solving the same PDE, but now you have fewer degrees of freedom because it's smaller, okay? Your domain is smaller, all right? So each, so now you can, you know, maybe small enough, the problem is now small enough that maybe you can feed it into a single processor and then it will do some sort of calculation. But of course, that's not the end of the story because, you know, you, the, the, all these, problems are coupled, right? So for example, if you solve the Laplace equation, um, the function and its derivatives need to be continuous. So if you don't, and, and then initially you don't know what the solution is you know, on the interface of the subdomain. So you just have some sort of random initial guess and then, and, and then you, you, know, you solve one iter, uh, you, you solve the subdomain problem using you know, this random guess on the interface. And then, of course, it's not going to match your neighbor in terms of, you know, uh, the derivatives, for example. It's going to make a kink somewhere. So then what you need to do is you need to talk to your neighbor. And then you, you, and then you get new information from the other guy. And then you try it again. And then, you know, you do many iterations. And then hopefully, eventually, the solution is going to converge to what you expect it to be, you know, what, what the global solution is. Okay? So the... So that's the basic idea, you know, uh, to have smaller problems and then you iterate by talking to, you know, different uh, subdomains to get, you know, the pertinent information and then you iterate until the thing converges. And the different methods within this umbrella of domain decomposition methods corresponds to different information being exchanged. So for example, you can exchange function values or normal derivatives or some linear combination Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And that's what makes different methods. And then all these methods have been developed, you know, very actively over the past three decades. Um, so it all kicked off um, as you know a, a particular field, uh, subfield of, uh, of of scientific computing since the con uh, since you know the first edition of a conference series that started in 1988. That's the 
international series of, of domain decomposition conferences. And actually, um, the 26th edition is being held in Hong Kong right now. So the first plenary lectures was this morning. I just attended it. Um, it's the first time we went virtual, so it was um, quite exceptional, but um, let's hope that it's as productive as the previous editions. Uh, um, and the theory is rapidly gaining maturity. So there are many survey papers and textbooks. Um, so you, you may even know some of these authors here. There are many successful algorithms, uh, such as FETI or balancing Neumann Neumann. And actually, FETI is uh, and its variants are really, you know, very commonly used in continuum mechanics and you know all, ma many different areas. It's it's one of the most successful class of methods for a parallel um, solution of you know very highly resolved you know numerical models that are modeled by PDs. Okay. And for many applications as well, Maxwell, Navier Stokes, Helmholtz, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Um, so, so that's uh, the so in domain decomposition. So that's when you decompose in space. So a lot of the theory has been worked out for spatial so problems, for elliptic problems. Okay. Uh, so time dependent problems is are, are I mean people are working very hard on it and it's you know being developed as well, but the theory is less complete. Okay. So let's see what sort of approaches we can use for um, time dependent problems. How much time do I have? Um, when am I supposed to stop? Uh, well, you have right now 34 minutes. Oh, 34 minutes. Okay, excellent. So maybe you know, when I'm up to the five, five minute mark, then you know, I'll, I'll tell you. Okay, thank you. All right. So, uh, so there are different ways of you know, dealing with time dependent problems. So the most classical way is to say, okay, let me discretize first in time. And then, you know, for example, backward Euler, but it could be many other things. It could be DDF formulas, it could be long uh, implicit long equator methods, it could be multi-step methods. Um, but basically, you know, once you've discretized in time, you get some sort of problem that is still posed in space that you need to solve. And that one, you can do it in parallel using any spatial domain decomposition methods that have been developed in the past few decades. Okay, so that's the most classical way of doing this, and people that, that, that are still doing it like that mostly. Okay, now of course the the the, the drawback here is that you know there's no parallelism in time. Okay, so if you have many time steps, so for example, if you're limited by a CFL conditions and you need and you need to you know integrate over many time steps, then each one of them is completely sequential. You know, you can't work on time step two before you finish time step one, okay? Um, the advantage, though, is there's lots of theory. Uh, and then the crucial questions here is um, for convergence, you know, how fast will the iterations converge at each time step? And scalability, whether, you know, there, whether convergence the convergence rate is maintained as I add more processors. You know, am I able to fill up my, uh, you know, my my cluster, uh, and and then get more speed up as I add processors? Okay, so that's you know one of the questions that people ask for this type of method. Okay, and then you know I've done a little bit of work in that as well. So for optimized Schwartz methods, where uh, basically the information getting exchanged is a linear combination of the function value and the derivative and the normal derivatives. And then of course, because it's a linear combination, there's a knob you can tune. You can decide how much of the uh, normal derivatives versus you know how much of the function value to take. And that turns out that if you tune it correctly, the convergence is a lot faster. And I've also done some nonlinear preconditioning that I'm not going to really talk about it in this in, in, in this presentation. Okay, and I already mentioned that the disadvantage is that it's sequential in time. Okay, so you, you don't gain anything in the time direction. There's a different, a second way of doing this, which is what is known as a waveform relaxation method. And then what you do here is you still decompose in space. Okay, so here in my diagram, I have two subdomains in space, but now the the sub problem that I am solving you know, in each of these subdomains is a space time problem. Okay. So I don't, I haven't discretized in, in time yet. Okay. The discretization in time comes after. 
So then what I do is I, I take my two subdomains, I'm going to in, integrate and solve my subdomain problems in space and time. And only after I'm done uh, integrating, uh, you know, solving the whole problem in space time, do I exchange information between processors, okay? So it's fewer messages, but uh, larger messages, you know, that contains you know, the whole interface information for the whole time interval, okay? So the advantages of this approach is that, you know, now you can, in, in each of your subdomain, you can use a different um, grid in space and in time. So that adds a lot of flexibility. So for example, if you have, um, you know, an ocean, you know, a problem where, you know, you're simulating the coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere, um, of course, you know, water flows more slowly than air. So you, it makes sense to use fewer time steps in the water part than in the atmospheric part. So that way you're not constrained by the fastest speeds and which, which you know, basically forces you, you to use a tiny time step everywhere where it, you know, it's, it's inefficient in, in the water. Okay? So there's more flexibility. And I also alluded to the fact that um, there are fewer messages that need to be exchanged. So if you have you know, a, a system with like significant delay in communication, then maybe you, know, you want to have fewer messages but larger messages each time you do the exchange, okay? And also there's super linear convergent, meaning that um, as you iterate, the convergence, that the reduction in error goes faster and faster. And this is a property of wave formalization methods that is not present for uh, problems that are posed in space only, okay? A third advantage, which I don't think I will, I'm going to go into a lot of detail, is you know parallelism in time. So you imagine that you know if I have two subdomains, officially, if you look at my previous diagram, it says you have to um, solve the problem over the whole time interval from zero to t, and then you exchange everything right uh, along you know the in, uh, the interface information. But if you think about it, if I so let's say I'm starting my first iteration you know, on both subdomains, so iteration one here, iteration one here. After I've integrated a little bit, even before I finish solving the whole problem, there is enough interface data that you can pass to your neighbor, and then your neighbor will have enough data to start the second iteration. Everything is there. I don't need to know the end of of the of the time window in order to you know start the initial few time steps right so that what that means is you know once i have enough data if i have um spare processors available let's say i don't manage to use uh, the, you know some of the processors effectively what i can do is i can start a second iteration using these spare processors and then i'm basically running two iterations at the same time okay so the first iteration will continue integrating later into the time horizon, say from T1 to T2, while the second iterate, second iteration has already started again from the initial value. And that adds, you know, potential parallel speed up. And I have, you know, written a, a paper about how to actually do this in an efficient way. So that only that came out last year. Uh, you know, it's called it's a technique we call pipeline. Okay. Uh, so that, that's another way of using up, you know, uh, more processors in order to get, you know, more speed up, okay? There's a third approach, which is domain decomposition and time. So what that means is now I, I'm not cutting uh, my spatial domain up, you know, into two subdomains. Now I'm really slicing along the time direction, okay? Uh, so this looks counterintuitive. Okay, well, I mean, officially I can sort of do the same you know, thing where you know, I have two subdomains interchange, you know, solving the problem and then exchanging information. But then this looks a little bit weird, right? Because it's, a, it's an evolution problem. It's an initial value problem. So basically, you know, if, uh, there, there's no use, uh, you would think that, you know, how do you get useful information in the second subdomain if, without finishing the integration in subdomain one. You know, you, because of causality, you want to solve the beginning first and then and then move on to the subsequent times, right? Well, it turns out that you can. 
uh, you, you, you can do useful work later in time, even though the initial time steps have not converged yet. And in fact, this is a very active research area for the past decade and a half. It now has its own website and its own dedicated workshop that meets yearly. It's called the Parallel in Time Workshop. And it, its ninth edition just happens you know, this past June, again, virtually, because we all know what happened. Uh, but you know, this is, again, a very active field of research. And then it can be combined with spatial parallelism. And then it can be applied to the initial value problems and also coupled forward backward problems from optimization, uh, which I'm going to go back to uh, a little bit later on in the, uh, in the talk. So let me explain in more detail how you know, this uh, time parallelization can do useful work. Okay? It all started with uh, an idea called parareal, which uh, was, uh, you know, came from you know, this first paper by uh, Jacques-Louis Lyon, Yvon Madet, and uh, Gabriel Turinissi in, in France. Okay? And here, they explicitly said that their goal here is to get some sort of real-time parallelism. So they're not looking for perfect scalability. So they're not saying that uh, if I throw in 10 times as many processors as I want, the the computing time to be divided by 10. That's not what they're after. They're saying that if I have a weather forecast that, you know, for tomorrow, that, that obviously needs to be finished within the next 24 hours, right? A, a, a 24 hour forecast that takes 30 hours to simulate is not very useful. So basically, if I have, you know, a lot of processors that I can use, even if I don't get perfect scalability, if I can get the simulation time down, if I can divide it by a factor of three, so instead of 30 hours, it takes 10 hours, that's already useful, okay? So basically we're trading, you know, a lot of extra processors for, for speed up that, you know, actual wall clock time speed up that, you know, will be useful in some circumstances, okay? So that's the, their goal. And then here is the idea, okay? Suppose they want to solve an ODE, a system of ODE, let's say, okay? which of course includes discretized PDE in space, all right? Uh, so let's say they want to do a, a simulation from time zero to time capital T, okay? So what their idea is, is that they want to cut up the subdomain into uh, the, 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 the time horizon into several subintervals, okay? Now, if you imagine that you know the solution exactly at these you know, time points, T1, T2, then et cetera, then each of these subdomains, uh, subintervals, you, uh, you can solve the problem on these intervals independently from one another, right? Because you know, once you have the initial value, that's it. You can, you can solve the problem exactly. So basically the, the, the task is to figure out what the solution is at these time points, okay? So we wanna solve for the unknown states YN, which is the solution value at these different time points. Okay, so uh, let's let me define P to be the solution operator, so the propagator that go that, that takes initial value at y i and produces the uh, the value at y i plus one. So it propagates things over one time interval. Okay, then the solution of the ODE system is precisely the one where the propagated values. Uh, by you know, match the value of the solution at the next interface, at the next time point, okay? So if you think about it, you can write it down as a system of nonlinear equations where if you subtract the new time point from the value propagated from the old time point, um, the difference is zero, okay? So you can set things up like this and you can just write everything down and this is the nonlinear system that you want to solve, okay? So you can solve this, let's say, by using a Newton's method, okay? So you linearize, so this is what Newton's method looks like. You add the uh, index of the iteration, k plus one and then k, okay? And then you basically just solve this. So it's all well and good, except that um, it's very expensive to evaluate these derivatives. Okay, so let's see how we can simplify the calculation. So the first thing is to say that, okay, I 
my, my original numerical method for integrating is expensive. So let me approximate it using a cheaper time discretization, let's say, you know, with fewer time step or lower order discretization. Okay, so like p hat instead of p. So that makes things cheaper already. Okay, so that's one approximation. Uh, so it's no longer an exact Newton method. You know, it's going to degrade the, cons uh, the convergence a little bit, but hopefully not too much. You still get reasonably fast convergence. That's number one. Number two, you can say, uh, well, instead of having a derivative times a difference, I'm going to, you know, approximate that by a finite difference. So here you see a k plus one here and a k here, which is it's you know which comes from this difference here between y k plus one and y k. Okay, so now that gives you a recurrence that you can solve, and this recurrence is triangular. So actually, it's like a, a forward substitution. You can you can finish, you can solve, uh, get the exact value after doing um, n steps of this recurrence, okay? So let's look at what the algorithm actually looks like. So here is my recurrence, okay? So there are pieces that you can do in parallel. So you see um, the expensive propagator here, the p, not the p hat, uh, only involves iterates from, uh, from iteration k. It only involves values from iteration k. So that means you can solve all of these in parallel. Okay, you have your y i y i minus one k at every time point from the previous iteration, and then you just do the top propagation. So this one's expensive but parallel. Okay, and then there's a there's a part there's a recurrence part which involves both k plus one. So this one you cannot do in parallel. Okay, because you have to start at y zero. And then, you know, once you have done this course propagation, um, you have the value for y1 k, you know, k plus 1. And then from the y1 k plus 1, you can do the y2 k plus 1. So this one's sequential, but it's cheap because I use the cheap approximation. Okay. So that's how you get a speed up. You know, the, the sequential piece, you approximate it cheaply. And then the expensive part, you use your 100 processors or whatever. And then you you try to take the expensive part and divide the computing time by 100, okay? Uh, so here's a, so a Brussels later problem. Let me just illustrate what happens, okay? Of course, you know, if convergence only comes after, you know, n sub intervals, then you haven't gained anything because every iteration is required, you know, the expensive propagator, okay? So if I divide by 32 sub intervals, I don't want convergence of 32 iterations. I want convergence much more quickly. Okay, but you can see, so here is a, a cartoon of what happens. Okay, uh, so after, so, so, the, so the red dots are the exact solution, you know, where I'm supposed to get, okay? And the blue one is what happens after one iteration. You see that the trajectory isn't quite continuous. So I haven't converged to the solution yet. And as you can see in the error, the first step is very good. You know, so the first step is exact. You're starting from exact initial conditions, but the rest is not quite there yet. But as I iterate, iteration two, three, four, five, six, seven, you see that even though that you know I haven't converged to machine precision, the rest of the solution, it's not z the error is not zero, but it converges fast enough that you see that you know for all you know for engineering purposes you know this is a very good solution so so instead of you know propagating over 32 intervals i've only done seven iterations so the speed up is about 32 divided by 7 okay so that's how you get speed up this way so if i have 32 processors that are all running at the same time after what the equivalent of you know integrating with seven steps i get convergence for you know the whole thing Okay, so that's how parallel gets to do useful work, even though um, it's not, you know, e e e even though, you know, things only change later. Uh, is there any questions? Yes. Okay. So this you implemented in which, using which uh, programming language? Oh, so here, I mean, in order to generate these pictures, I only did it in MATLAB, but there are actual, um, uh, it, you know, implement parallel implementations. You know, there are libraries for doing this. I think XBraid 
use does something called multi-grid reduction in time, which if you set it up, you know, cor uh, you know, in a specific way, it is equivalent to parallel. You can show this, and then you know they they actually observe fast convergence for not for everything, but it depends on the ODE, obviously. But you know, some of them, it really works very well. Like, uh, and the brusolator, did you simulate the PDE itself, or you simulated the truncation of the PDE? This one, this one is an ODE. Or oh, this is the ODE. Okay, this, this is the ODE no diffusion. Okay. There's a PDE version as well, and I think we might have done that for one of the one of our papers, but I don't remember exactly. Okay. Okay. Uh, so there's an overlapping variance because you know in domain decomposition you can overlap subdomains as well, and usually that gives you faster convergence. And then there's a result that uh, basically, I think I'm going to skip this because I'm running a little bit short on time. But basically, um, it does give faster, faster convergence, but because it's also more extensive, then depending on you know which uh, PD you're doing and which integrate uh, which uh, integrator you're using, then sometimes it's worth it in terms of wall clock, wall clock time, and sometimes it isn't. But there is, uh, and then you know, and then so there are two interesting things about this overlapping variant. It's that. Uh, for in some setup, it is equivalent to the multi-grid reduction in time method that I was explaining, which is sort of another way of trying to do you know parallel in time methods. And this one comes from the multi-grid community. And what we managed to do by proving this equivalence is that it allows us to analyze the convergence also in this parallel way which um, also takes into account nonlinear problems where, where whereas multi-grid analysis historically is based on linear operators because that's how the community uh, has started okay so there's a theorem that shows the, uh, the convergence and then and that leads to super linear convergence estimates for also for these um, end grid um, algorithms and there are other approaches of course for doing um, parallel in time, okay, which I'm not going to go into details on. So there's an, there's a, a, an error estimates that can be derived. I'm not going to show, the, I'm not going to talk about the proof of that. Let me jump immediately to the second part, which is the optimal control problems. So here by optimal control, I mean that for a given time horizon, I want a system of study under study to behave exactly the way we wish. And this is a direct quote from Jolinsky and Lyons, uh, which is a very well-known book on optimal control problems. Uh, so I've already shown you this problem before. Okay, there's some target that I want to match. And then you're subject to an ODE constraint, which can be a discretized ODE. Okay, and this is basically like a nonlinear least squares problem. Um, so our approach here is to look at is to form the first order optimality system by using Lagrange multipliers, and then you know if there are no control constraints, then at, you can actually eliminate the control because there's an algebraic relation between the Lagrange multiplier and the control function. Okay, and that will lead to a coupled forward backward problem. You have the state equation that is evolving, you know, forward in time. And then you have an adjoint state lambda, which evolves from a final condition backward in time. Okay. And these two objects are coupled. Okay. So if you imagine what you have to do, now you can no longer just do a pure time step thing. You have to set up your whole system with all, with all the time points coupled between the, the state and the adjoint. So that's even more variables. And it's even more crucial to use parallelism, to use all your computers on your computing cluster. Okay, so here our idea is to do something similar to you know what I explained in Parallel, which is to take my time horizon and to cut it up into uh, sub into you know different sub intervals. Okay, so now on each sub interval we have a smaller optimal control problem, a smaller optimality system where you have. Uh, a state part which propagates forward in time from T1 to T2, and then an adjoint part which propagates backwards in time from T2 to T1, okay? So if you have all the intermediate states uh, for both the state and the adjoints, then you can solve these you know, 
uh, subdomain or subinterval problems in parallel. Okay. So let me explain to you one of uh, the work, one of our latest work here. Actually, it's it's been uh, published. It appears in 2020 in Siam, in the Siam Journal on uh, Scientific Computing. So this should be 2020. Okay. Uh, so basically, the the basic idea is not so different from Parareal itself. So I have a fine propagator and a coarse propagator, which I call P and p hat for the state uh, problem, and then q and q hat for the adjoint problem. Okay, you see that one of them propagates forward and the other one propagates backwards. You write down the equations of continuity that needs to be satisfied. So basically it's the same as before, but everything is doubled because there's the adjoint as well, okay? And then now we look at what Newton's method does. So you linearize these equations. And then again, you get these derivative terms, which are still expensive to evaluate. So we want to uh, make it cheaper. Okay. Uh, so we make it cheaper by replacing it by a coarse approximation. So here we coarse it by taking larger time steps, but using the same method. Okay. But this time we don't want to, you know, do the finite difference thing anymore because everything is still coupled forward and backward. So you can't just do a forward substitution. And then you know, if, and then also these propagators themselves are nonlinear. There are a lot of work to solve, so you don't actually want to do that. So you just want to leave them as derivatives, okay? And then what happens is that you're going to have to solve at every Newton step a problem that is that essentially contains all these derivatives, and you know, you write down a big block matrix like this, and then each Newton iteration requires. A solution involving this type of matrix. Okay. So now the question is, you know, how does this perform? How fast does this converge? Well, uh, first of all, uh, there's one variance that I'm going to show you, which is, um, you know, I'm going to drop these terms already because these terms only depend on the second derivative. So if you drop them, it's like replacing a Newton by a Gauss Newton. Okay. And also, when the problem is linear, there's no second derivative um, in the you know in, in the OD uh, function. So then um, this term also drops out. Okay. So for the analysis, when we analyze the linear uh, con uh, convergence for a linear problem, I'm just going to put these terms to zero. So this is the kind of matrix that I want to analyze when I do the para real uh, para opt iteration. Okay. Uh, now, because I approximated the derivative, this is not an exact Newton method. So even for a linear problem, it's not going to converge in one iteration. So there's actually something to analyze here. Okay, so we want to analyze the spectral radius of the iteration matrix, which looks like this. Uh, I'm going to make one more assumption, which is, you know, in addition to being a linear problem, I also assume that the matrix A here is a symmetric positive definite problem. And even though you know this is some, uh, th this does not make the problem very general, it takes into account interesting cases such as like the diffusion problem, you know, a heat equation or some sort of um, diffusion process that gives you a symmetric positive definite um, operator in space. Okay, uh, the reason I made this assumption is because it allows me to diagonalize the problem, and then you know basically. The whole thing decouples into like one independent problem per eigenvalue and per spatial mode for this um, spatial operator. Okay, so I, I'm basically looking at the scalar case, one for each eigenvalue, and then I want to value uh, vary the eigenvalues in order to look at you know what the slowest converging mode is, and then I'm going to say something about the convergence. So basically. Uh, it's the same type of matrix that we need to solve, except that everything became a scalar because I just diagonalized. So I need to uh, look at, I, I, I need to compute what these uh, parameters are as a function of eigenvalues that appear in this matrix A. Okay, so it's, so it's going to depend on sigma, which is the eigenvalue in question. And it's also going to depend on the fine and the coarse time step that I'm using in the in my integrator. Okay. Um, 
Well, to make a long story short, uh, so, so yes, five minutes. Five oh, thank minutes. you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, it should be done in five minutes. So, so there is a lemma which basically says I can characterize the. I, I know what the characteristic polynomial looks like, and then I also know what the roots look like. Let me show you what the roots look like. So actually, it has a very special structure. Uh, everything lies inside a, a disk of a certain radius that I can characterize, except for one eigenvalue which falls outside. And that one I can also work out, you know, I can bound how large it is. Okay. And in order to prove this, you actually need to look at, you know, use some complex analysis, use the argument principle, and basically look at, you know, where this, you know, what, what the image of this disk is. Uh, well, this circle is under the, the image of the characteristic polynomial. And then you basically look at you know, how many times it goes around um, a point that is on the negative real axis. Okay, so it's basically a winding number argument. And you're going to see that it only goes around that point at most once. So there's only one eigenvalue outside that disk. Okay, and then once you do that, you can, you, you can quantify how far away from the origin that lone eigenvalue is, it turns out that, you know, it somehow, it depends on, um, you know, the eigenvalues of the spatial operator and it, it reaches its maximum somewhere in mid frequency. So you need to bound that. And then once you do everything, uh, you notice that, you know, you can estimate the contraction factor by this expression and the the nice thing is that it only depends on your course times your course integrator, your course approximation, how large that time step is. So as long as that time step is not too large with respect to your regularization parameter, then you have convergence of the method. Okay. And also this estimate is independent of the number of subintervals, which means that you can throw lots of processors into this thing. Okay. So you have lots of independent pieces of the problem and it's not gonna affect the convergence. So this is what is known as scalability. So you, you, can, you can create more subintervals and then if everything converges at the same rate, then, you, then because your subdomain problems are smaller, then you finish you know, the solution faster okay, without affecting you know, the quality of the solution. Okay, so this is a scalable method. Let me just show you one fun example. Uh, which is the Lotka Volterra equation. So you see that, you know, if I run the Gauss Newton, so this is the exact trajectory which sort of goes around in the loop. The initial guess is nothing like that, but then if you, if you iterate, then it basically, you know, expands around and, it can, and then it, it converges to that exact trajectory. And then if you look at the convergence, if I add num the number of sub if you know the number of subdomains go from 10 to 50, you see that um, the contraction rate is very similar. The error decreases essentially at the same rate. Okay. And then just to come full circle, let me show you what happens if I apply this method to my advection diffusion problem with the contaminant tracking. Um, this is not a huge problem. It, in space, it's only seven. 100 and odd domain, uh, degrees of freedom. But if you have 640 time steps, then it very quickly goes into like 42, you know, 420,000 or something like this. Or 40, I don't remember exactly. Okay, but it's, it's still a large enough problem. Okay. Uh, again, you know, if I'm concerned with scalability, I'll fix my uh, course time step and I look at what happens to the convergence as I make more and more subdomains and you see that it's sort of, I mean, as you add subdomains, it, it, it slows down slightly, but then it's sort of, it seems to all be bounded by this, this uh, constant slope, slope here, which tells you that the contraction factor is, uh, does not deteriorate as you add more and more subdomains. So the method is scalable. Okay, so I have uh, spoken about, you know, parallel and time methods both for an, uh, initial value problem where you simulate a direct problem in time and also an optimal control problem where it's coupled forward and backwards. Okay, so there's lots to do in terms of ongoing work, uh, but I, I'm going to stop here. And here are some references of stuff that I have mentioned. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Felix.
Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for a very, uh, very nice and broad and yeah, I, I, I really liked it. Yeah. Are there any questions or comments? You just unmute yourself or write it in a chat. So maybe I'll start. James yeah. Raised his hand. That's okay. Yeah. Professor Chang, yes, you may you may go and ask a question. Uh, I think, are you muted? You might be muted. Sorry. Now, you mentioned that matrix A is, is assumed to be symmetric or positive definite. Yeah. Uh, uh, the reason you said that you just want to decouple? Well, OK. so. The re well, the, the real reason is, you know, we need to start analyzing things somewhere. So the, the, it's sort of the easiest case to do that covers something interesting. So for, it covers like, you know, a diffusion equation. But of course, th that's not the end goal, right? We're actually also working on, um, you know, a, a more general analysis where, you know, locally the solution can be growing. You know, uh, so that will al allow some positive eigenvalues or some complex eigenvalues if you have, you know, uh, oscillatory phenomena like wave propagation. We also want to know what happens there. But um, this analysis doesn't get you there. But uh, we have some experiments, numerical experiments that show that, well, even with the Laca Volterra, um, that one doesn't have negative real eigenvalues. Okay, I think it has some positive eigenvalues. It looks like it scales. Um, we don't have an analysis for that as of this moment. But you know, this is definitely something we plan to do. So that's on our to-do list. So if you assume it is symmetric, it's not enough. Uh, it's enough to diagonalize, but the bound is not valid. The bound that I showed you depends mm -hmm. on uh, the eigenvalues having a certain sign. So mm -hmm. if the if the eigenvalues become positive, then the, then the one the the the, the picture oh there was, there was this picture with the circle and then one isolated eigenvalue right so there's this one uh, if the if the eigenvalues if sigma goes positive then it's gonna it's still gonna have the same shape but it's gonna be outside the disk and then so basically the the question is how large do I have to make the disk to you know make sure everything stays in and that's not an easy question to answer. At least one of the techniques we presented in that paper doesn't quite work. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, could you, you look at uh, page 20? Page 20. Uh, I get the... Like this? Are you, oh, yeah, you mentioned the uh, parallel uh, computing and yeah. the four the second item, you have to do this sequentially. There's a parallel part and there's a sequential part. Okay, so not everything is parallel. But then uh, the, the, hopefully, so the, the, what we want is that the expensive part is parallel and the sequential part is cheap. So let's say if the coarse integrator takes 100th of the time of the fine integrator, then you can allow yourself every once in a while to have a sequential propagation Whereas the expensive, the, the, the 100 times more expensive bit, you distribute it to like 500 processors and then you gain something. That's, so, so for this, you cannot like apply chaotic relaxation approach? Uh, this oh, God, is I not a thing that I have looked at, but uh, basically here we want to have some sort of exact convergence, right? We want at the end, we, we want the thing to converge to the fine grid solution at the end of the day. So, uh, so, so that's why, you know, uh, it, it needs some sort of sequential propagation. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's I mean, you, if you do everything parallel, it, it doesn't know, like the, the last subdomain doesn't know what the initial conditions are, right? Okay. So how do you actually, you know, get the correct solution? So, what I mean is that it, probably you can use some other, like, a, the value by i minus one and other iteration at the previous. Oh, there, there are other iterations available. I, I'm, I'm presenting one version. So Parareal does this. So this is how Parareal is set up. Of course, there are other um, 
parallel in time methods. But I think, you know, so not all of them have a sequential bits, but I think the ones that don't have a sequential bits don't converge fast enough to be useful. This is the sequential propagation is the one that allows you to converge in fewer number of iterations than there are time intervals. Thank you. All right, other questions or comments? Yeah, so I will ask one. So your method is kind of based on this zero finding problem that you're solving using Newton. Uh -huh. And uh, sometimes the Bayesian of attraction of Newton is kind of small. Sometimes you get out of the Bayesian of attraction. And so have you, have you kind of, in, I mean, thought of, or maybe this is done like of uh, combining this approach with more classical continuation methods, predictor, corrector, where you kind of use a parameter to kind of, uh, kind of control the, the, the initial guy of Newton in order to maximize your convergence? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so for initial value problems, it, you can actually prove that no matter what course approximation you use, uh, it always converges to the exact solution in n steps, where n is the number of subintervals. So it's guaranteed to do that, at least you know, if there's no round off errors, okay? Um, because it's unique, because, it, because of the unicity of the problem. Yeah, and also because it's a triangular problem, essentially. Uh -huh. I mean, if you look at the Jacobian, it's a triangular matrix. So it, it has to do that. But somehow, like, we went to get there before the, tri the triangle is complete. So, so okay. then, yeah, yes. that's how, okay. yeah. So I, I get it, but still, I mean, it, the fact that you know it's going to converge, but it's, it's taking you, I don't know, uh, seven or eight steps. Yeah. And maybe if you incorporate, I, I don't know, but if you incorporate that into a continuation, maybe it would take you two or three steps, say. It's possible. Uh, on the other hand, the, the figuring out the continuation, like doing the continuation, is it more expensive than... Yeah, that, that's why I ask because yeah, it, you, you could have you could have a very natural parameter dependence in your problem where you you may want to solve more than one initial value problem. You have a temperature, yeah. or you have some I mean some physical parameters, and then you know so you, some sort of warm start or something. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, and usually these are done using exactly I mean the kind of things you're you're trying to avoid, right? To evaluate derivative. Now you have derivative with respect to parameters, but maybe yeah. using your kind of adapt you your kind of ways to to make that cheaper. Yeah, because it, because a predictor is basically you, you need to have a per, some sort of partial derivative of, at the solution with yeah. respect to the parameter that you have, yes. and maybe you know these red these red hats they, they are simplified version. Maybe they, I was just curious if you yeah if kind of done. I think well right now the the red hat is definitely like a coarser approximation, so we don't actually take derivatives. I mean, written with this recurrence. We don't take derivatives anymore. These are just coarser approximations of the problem. So you evaluate the propagator by actually solving the OD, but with a coarser discretization. So here there is no derivatives, but in right. the optimal control version, uh, we figure that the derivatives are about as expensive as solving the nonlinear propagation problem that is coupled. So we just left it there. Yeah, yeah, because the, the, I mean, if you think about it, a continuation, a simple predictor corrector, it's basically Euler, Euler's method in the yeah. parameter space. So to some extent, you know, yes. it's very similar to propagating in time, but now you're propagating yes. in the parameter. And if you have yes. a cheap way to do that in time, yes. perhaps you could have a cheap way to do it in the parameter. And yeah. then you could reduce by many maybe uh, many steps your convergence in, in Newton, if, if that makes sense, of course, if you, don't, if you don't have parameters to play with, then, but I was just curious to know. Yeah, uh, we haven't tried that, but this is definitely something that would be very interesting to look at. Okay. Okay, all right, so other, other, other questions or comments? Um, it's already five past right now here, so let's say uh, unless, unless someone Raises a raises the hand or something. Yeah, so let's let's call it a day. Oh, thank you very much, Felix, for your your very nice talk. Very, uh, I mean, very impressive. I mean, have you? Uh, so now you did a two D two D example. Have you done it, or will you do a three D example in the near future, or that's kind of 